Hello everyone, this is Barry Owen from Wowza Media Systems and I'm here at NAB 2018 with Chris Knowlton and Tim Siglin and today we are going to talk the ever popular topic of Codex. <laughs> Ooh, Welcome gentlemen. Thank, Thank you, Barry. Nice to be here. So, I've had probably more questions about Codex this show than I can imagine ever having before in total. So there's clearly, you know, the topic's clearly on people's minds. So, so what, what's driving the change and what's driving the, the need for different, more better? Well, you want me to take the sure, first part of that? Sure, you know, I think part of what's driving it is somewhat artificial, sort of like 3D TV from years ago. You have, you have a model where companies are saying, we want to sell 4K acquisition devices, therefore you need a 4K capable codec. Um, on the flip side, the consumer is still watching 720p and a little bit of 1080p, and you're hearing the platform companies say the sweet spot is 1080p high frame rate and HDR 10-bit, not 4K. So, so to me, there's a bit of it that's artificial, but on the flip side, we're always looking for better ways to compress, whether it's through a, a quality optimization or more efficiency in the codec itself. Yeah, we, we certainly get people asking about um, changing codecs to reduce file size or reduce bandwidth usage. Sure. And that seems to at least be driving part of that. Mm -hmm. Thoughts, yeah, Chris? Yeah, it, so I agree. And, and, and I think that is a key factor because a lot of people, as they actually start scaling up, as people see, I, I just moderated a panel on going from 100,000 viewers to a million. And, it, and when you get into scales that are much larger, like 10 times larger than what you're used to, you suddenly get this big CDN bill maybe right. for the delivery. And suddenly you're like, oh, I could really use a little, a little, bit, lower, a little bit lower cost. How can I lop off 20 to 40% of my cost? And if you come up with a codec that allows you to do so, mm. As, as the promise of many of the new codecs is, is that they can save you 20 to 40% on your bill by compressing right. further, then you are going to have uh, an incentive to go and look into that. The, the challenge, of course, is that a lot of those people who are going to be watching your content may not have H.265, for example, on their device to be able to play that back. Right. Or they're not going to have AV1, the, the newly announced Alliance for Open Media codec, which is now, the code's finally been frozen for, so you know we'll start seeing some content created with AV1, but nobody has that as a player yet. So it's, right. it's a balance between these new codecs, which offer these great things, or using older codecs with maybe higher compression technologies right. applied to them. Absolutely. To, yeah, to let's, get, to let's get, talk about that a little bit. So sure. I've, I've seen a lot of what I'll call compression optimizers at mm -hmm. the show. You know, you have Vinova, you have Idiom doing some interesting stuff. Right. You've got Euclid, who I worked for, Beamer, a couple other companies. Yeah, and, and, and even with, I know, you know, machine learning to analyze the frames before compression sure. to dial things down. What's, what's the role of those moving forward versus jumping all the way to a new codec? So fundamentally to me, that is an area that we need to address regardless of what the codec is. So if you okay. have AV1, if you have HEVC slash H265, if you have AVC, you know, which has been optimized fairly well, or H.264. Fundamentally, what you're looking at, as you said, is what's the frame comprised of? What are the few frames on one side or the other of it comprised of? That's what we call inter-frame compression. And how can we decide where to apply the processing power in a given frame to reduce the bandwidth but keep the quality level? And what you're hearing consistently is, to Chris's point, Companies will absolutely want to reduce the bandwidth, but they've gotten their customers used to a particular quality. Right. So you have to stay at that quality, whether you move to a new codec or whether you use one of those optimization techniques. The problem with most of those is the speed that it takes to get that bandwidth reduction. So live is one of those sort of wild west areas right, right. now that we don't know whether we can really do optimization in, because you really can only do four or five frames, otherwise you're going to add a lot more latency on top of sure. it. Sure. Yeah, and it, the interesting approach is in, you know, how fast can I analyze a frame before right. I can, you know, sure. even, more, even more horsepower is mm -hmm. needed. And some of these codecs are already, you know, sucking the life out of a lot of the machines trying to process it. And to Chris's point, even on the decode side, the devices to play back right. may not have the capability. One of the things that does give me hope with AV1, and I'm not a huge proponent of HEVC or AV1, we'll talk about licensing in a minute, I'm sure, but 
One of the things that gives me hope is having done consulting to Wowza, or sorry, not Wowza, um, to on two years ago, every time they came out with a codec, they made it so that you could play it on a lower processor speed rather than a higher processor speed. Okay. In the in the MPEG world, you always have to have almost double the, the capacity on processor speed. So if AV1 follows the trend of VP6, VP7, VP8, VP9 to AV1, and you can play it on lower and lower processor speed devices, that means your battery consumption is in a Absolutely. much better scenario. Where right now with HEVC, you may not even be able to make it through a movie on a traditional device because right. it's just killing the processor, which is killing the battery. Yeah, and 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 obviously for us, we care about the encode site as well sure. when we're transcoding. And you know, two six five is is a lot more expensive to mm -hmm. encode than than two six four. From what I hear, VP nine is crazy expensive at the moment for sure. It will get optimized. Right. Exactly. Um, is VP nine the forgotten codec at this point? <laughs> I always thought VP8 was the forgotten codec, but I think the, the cousin of that is VP9. It's, you know, there was that whole promise of it's going to be on a lot of hardware devices for decoding. We didn't, even when we saw it materialize, it materialized too late. And as a result, AVC was already on a lot of those same devices for decoding. Um, Jan Ozer loves VP9. I'm sort of on the fence on that. I think it's better optimized than AV1, clearly at this point. And it's sure. going to take AV1 a, you know, a couple of years well, to get the optimization. And VP9's in hardware on some devices. Yeah, you absolutely. Do, quick sync. do you all find, you know, turning that back, does Wowza find a lot of VP9 delivery requirement? No, not really. Okay. And, I, mean. and I, I think we all sort of got to the point where we breathe the sigh of relief and we're using H.264. So that's why I say it's in some some ways artificial. We're having to push forward it's, right. with this. It, it's like comfort food, right? I mean, you know what you're going to get. <laughs> right. Right, but right, right. Yeah, and for so many years we had codec wars between Real and Microsoft. Mm. You know, it, and it was so nice to sort of start finally, you know, centralizing all our efforts on H.264, knowing that it's in all of the devices that are out there, right? Like any, right. any anybody I send H.264 to can consume that content. Right. And right. so, so putting on my blue frame hat for a moment, thinking about a lot of our rural viewers who, who have really you know, low DSL bandwidth, yep. they can't watch our content if it's super high resolution, right. super high bit rate. Uh, but if I can send them an H.264 stream and I can find some way to optimize it a little bit more, I know they're going to be able to play it back. Because it's H.264, I know it'll be able to decode very easily. Uh, if I can get a little bit more bandwidth out of it and send them what would normally be a 1.5 megabit per second stream at 800 kilobits per second or something, then I know I have a much better chance of reaching all of those viewers with a higher quality stream than I could before, and right. they'll have a better experience. I won't have to have any dependency on the client side for right. a specific codec to be there. I don't have to change too much on my encoding side, mm. except perhaps add in this a more efficient encoding engine. But that is a software change for me. That's fairly easy to do as long as my machine can handle it. And most of the machines that are being used for production in our scenarios can handle a little bit more core processing at the codec level. So for me, that is seems like a much more valuable way to go until we get into actual 4K content and, and things like that where we're having something like AV1 or HEVC where it really compresses at the high, and super high and super high resolutions right. better than H.264. Right. But, but here's the interesting scenario. We may get optimization to a point where it actually lets us do UHD or 4K at 1080p bandwidths. And if that's the case, then it begs the question of do we have to go to those new codecs? I'm not saying we're going to get right. there overnight, but I think as AV1's optimized and HEVC is optimized, we continue to have this quality optimization piece that comes right. along that fundamentally is codec agnostic, but is working to allow H.264 to continue to have legs. And I think one of the other big things, to Chris's point on the rural, you live in a connected city, I live in the heartland, so I know that problem. Um, the time to first frame or first frame for playback, sure. as you're lowering the bandwidth, that means it, you can deliver those segments a lot faster, sure. and and the likelihood of buffering being lower right. and those types of things. Right. So, so really, when we talk about codecs, we're talking about how do we lower the bandwidth? It's a better experience overall. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Let, so let, let's talk about the the patent and royalty issues surrounding <laughs> codecs. So let's we've not. all. <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding, right? 
I mean, we've, we've all kind of come to terms with 264. We can right. live with it. It seems manageable. There's an incredible amount, incredible amount of FUD around HEVC and patents. Right. And the promise of a royalty-free future with AV1 is, is very interesting for yeah, people. Yeah, it's pretty appealing, you have to it's admit. It's pretty compelling, yeah. Right, you don't hear any of the, you don't, right, with HEVC and multiple patent pools, you don't know who you're going to have to pay, how much you have to pay, if there's a ceiling or and, not. And even who you have to pay at this right, point. Right, exactly, right. With AB1, you don't hear any of that because it's all open source. And, and yet, fascinatingly, VP9 had the same premise with, against H264. Right, right, exactly. The, the MPEG LA patent pool took care of it by just going, yeah, you know what, we won't charge you royalties and all of a sudden the whole discussion went away. So to me, Chris, to your point, you got MPEG LA and HEVC Advance. Advance has made the decision not to charge the royalties for streaming right. MPEG LA. We don't know yet right. what's going to happen. That, there's, there's still that uncertainty. uncertainty. Yeah. But if they chose, and, and this is something Jan Ozer and I wrote, back, wrote about back in 2010 with AVC H264, the moment those patent pools go, you know what, we're going to kick the royalty can down the road, all of a sudden the adoption discussion is over. Do you think A do, A do you think that's going to happen and B how much do you think the uncertainty is hurting the adoption of HEVC? I, I think uncertainty is absolutely hurting the adoption and I think having two patent pools really hurts it. I was surprised that the lesson was not learned with AVC uh, H264 because if you may recall the whole discussion we had around AVC was in 2009. And at first they said, we're going to push it to 2013. Then in 2010, they're like, we're going to push it to 2015. Then in 2011, they said, we're just not going to charge them at all. And, and I had hoped that that lesson was learned there. But I think right. what happened was the patent holders thought, let's let AVC get traction. We'll introduce HEVC, and then we'll collect the royalties at that point, forgetting thankfully, on some level, forgetting that there's innovation in the market beyond just MPEG. And sure. that's why I like VP9 and AV1, because it forces continuous innovation, both on licensing as well point. as on the codexes right. as well. So right. I, I hope we're close to not having to have this discussion, but <laughs> because of the two patent pools, who knows? Right. Great. Uh, last question. Okay. We come back here five years from now, what are we talking about? Well, Microsoft will have a version of HEVC, I'm sure, just like they had a version of MPEG-4. Uh, no, I, I, I think we're gonna be back having the exact same discussion <laughs> because every year there's, can we drive it lower? Can we make it better quality when we drive it lower? And who stands to benefit from it? The consumer, the content producer, the delivery network, or the patent holder. Do you, so, think, do you think H.264 will still be the baseline at that point? The, the, I, I actually think H.264, just like RTMP, is going to be around a lot longer than we expect. All right. If those quality optimization tools can get it to a 50% bandwidth reduction, yep. there's no reason to move off of it. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. But fortunately, with, with products like, you know, Wow's the streaming engine, putting a plug in for you guys, you're set up to handle multiple codecs, multiple Absolutely. packaging yeah. solutions. So when Chris talks about how people can watch H.264 today, it's true, but what you have to be able to do now is repackage it in HLS or Dash or some other form of delivery, and that's where uh, you know a streaming engine comes into play as well. Yeah, for sure. Right. That simplifies, I mean, my life, it, you know, for our customers, which are going from at the venue up to basically Wowza streaming engine in the cloud, you know, that I still have to figure out how to improve that first mile contribution from my encoder to Wowza. Right. If I can do that through additional compression of H.264, I'm happy. Beyond that, I know that Wowza will cover me as far as everything else I need, and eventually probably including more efficient H.264 codecs. Uh, that'll allow me to actually reach more of my viewers. And so that's reassuring that I only have to figure out that first part and that I can rely on Wowza to handle the second part. And, and of course, we'll also put a plug in. The last time we worked together on something was the latency white paper for Wowza, yes. which is a whole nother part of the discussion. Absolutely. It needs to be addressed because we're stuck in this sort of two second segment world. And that's not where people want, if they change the channel, quote unquote, in OTT, they don't right. want to wait for four seconds for it to change. Yeah, they want sure. an instantaneous switch. Right. So. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a whole other discussion we that's can have right. another day. Exactly. <laughs> right. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. Appreciate awesome. it. Sure, thanks, thanks for having us.